Recently, we had an overview of the Wright Cyclone R1820 engines with our master mechanic, James Kelly. Today, we want to go over some of the improvements we've made on these R1820-97 engines here at the Fort Worth Vintage Flying Museum. These improvements add to the reliability, serviceability, and maintainability of these engines. With pilot and owner needs as a primary focus, work is proceeding on ideas provided to us through the beer-soaked brain of Air Force Captain IC Planes. These crudely conceived ideas of an engine that will not only provide inverse reactive current for use in unilateral phase detractors, but would also be capable of automatically synchronizing the three cardinal gram meters. This engine now includes the turbo encabulator. Now basically the only new principle involved is that instead of power being generated by the relative motion of conductors and fluxes, it's produced by the modal interaction of magnetoreluctance and capacitive directance. The original machine had a base plate of pre-famulated amulite surrounded by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with the panometric fan. The latter consisted simply of nine hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that side fumbling was effectively prevented. The main winding was of the normal lotus or delta type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator. Every ninth conductor being connected by a non-reversible trimmy pipe to the differential girdle spring on the up end of the three gram meters. The turbo encabulator has now reached a high level of development and it's being successfully used in the operation of Dover Tremens as evidence here in our B-17. Now that we know how the turbo encabulator works, let's take a look at its diagnosis and service. For the purposes of obscurity, we have left the casing on so as not to expose the heart of the turbo encabulator or magneto-reluctance modal interactor. Since little or nothing is known about the principles involved in magneto-reluctance, diagnosing faults can be a problem. Connect a common yellow and black sparsal meter to the aft end of the moxie interrupter at the end of the two gram meters. Using special cloth towels, making sure that the osmolality of the phase detractors is not extrapolated. Enter the bureau model number, including the dash number, into your sparsal meter. Select the turbo encabulator run test. If there are any errors, they will be displayed in secret code, decipherable by your 1944 model Enigma machine. The most common fault is sigmoid rumbling below the belt line, which your pilot will refer to as a burping or hiccuping noise. To service this fault, refer to the turbo encabulator diagnostic manual and songbook and perform test TE10. Using the Geiger scale on your sparsal meter, measure the Rontgen output of the capacitance reluctance flux muster. If it's above 10 Rontgens, replace the unit. If it's below 10 Rontgens, you will be directed to perform a series of tests that will raise your effective billable hours to your organization, but will perform no other useful function. All other faults should be treated as if they do not exist, and your pilot should be chided, reminding him that he is just a pilot and that the burping or hiccuping noise is normal and caused by too much gas in the fuel lines. Be here next month when we will discuss cigarette lighter diagnosis, maintenance, and replacement in the B-17 Model G.